The Novum Testamentum Grätze, most often briefly just called Nestle Arland, provides a wealth of information on comparatively little space. Alongside the Greek text, different information is grouped. Basically, a page of the Nestle Arland consists of five parts. The top margin provides a running header. The Greek text is printed in the center of the page. In the outer margin, references to parallel passages or verses are registered. The inner margin offers some structuring features. The bottom of the page, finally, presents the textual apparatus with alternative readings and their attestation in the manuscripts. In this presentation, the focus will lie on the textual apparatus because its comprehensiveness probably is the main characteristic of the edition, especially compared to other modern hand editions of the Greek New Testament. However, we will also dig into the other parts of the Nestle Arland. First, I want to show you some peculiarities of the edition. In order to provide as much information as possible within the given li limits of a hand edition, the information is presented in a concise and somehow idiosyncratic way. I especially refer to the use of certain signs that introduce each apparatus entry. You can see some of them here in the apparatus of the first page of the edition. For each sign in the apparatus, a corresponding sign can be found in the text. Some information is given in brackets. What does that mean? And then we see that in some cases the abbreviation TXT precedes a list of witnesses at the end of an apparatus unit, whereas in other cases this abbreviation is missing. However, challenges lurk also elsewhere in the edition. Have you, for example, ever thought about the exclamation marks that follow some of the references in the margin and about the raised dots? And then there are some cryptic Arabic and Latin numbers in the inner margin of the book. Not to mention the different appendices with their beautiful Latin names. Even experts are often unfamiliar with them. Let us first talk about the textual apparatus. There are two categories of apparatus units, positive and negative apparatuses. The UBS Greek New Testament, for comparison, only knows positive apparatuses. Positive apparatus means that, apart from the attestation for the variant reading or readings, also the attestation for the text reading is displayed. Let me show you an example. In Romans 5 verse 1, Paul claims that we as Christians have peace with God. Or does he? What do we read in the text? Dikaiotentes un epistemus erenen echumen prostonteon, diatu curiu hemon Jesu Christu. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But what does that sign mean, this little hook? which we see in the Greek text as well as in the apparatus. In the introduction, these signs are explained. There is no way around. You need to make yourself familiar with them. They are not many. On page 56, we read about this one. The word following in the text is replaced with one or more words by the witnesses cited. Let's see how the information in the apparatus is structured here. The Nestle Island always gives the alternative reading or readings at the beginning of the apparatus unit. The wording of the reading is followed by the list of witnesses in its support. The witnesses that support the text reading can be found at the end of the apparatus unit in case of a positive apparatus. Instead of repeating the entire lemma, which could be pretty long, long in many cases, you will only find the abbreviation TXT at the beginning of the list. It stands for Textus Latin or Text English. So this apparatus unit is pretty easy to understand. There is one alternative reading which reads Echumen with Omega instead of Echumen with Omicron. The two words differ regarding the mood. Whereas echumen is indicative, echumen is subjunctive. In case of the indicative form is original, Paul states that we have peace with God. In case we have to read the subjunctive, 
Paul exhorts us to have peace with God. Let us have peace with God. A good example for a minimal difference in the wording with a remarkable impact in meaning. We will have a closer look at this apparatus unit in a minute, but let's first examine a negative apparatus. I have again chosen a very simple example. In Romans 3, verse 27, Paul asks, Puun he kauchesis, what becomes now of the boasting? The critical sign used here slightly differs from that in Romans 5.1 and indicates an insertion after the final word kauchesis. There is a negative apparatus for this insertion, which says, which says that some manuscripts and the pronouns add the pronoun su after kauchesis. What becomes now of your boasting? Two unseals and part of the Latin tradition support this reading. No evidence is given for the reading in the text, that means for the reading without the addition. In cases like this, we are speaking of a negative apparatus. But why is the attestation for the text not listed? The reason probably is that there can hardly be any doubt that the pronoun originally missed in the text, but is in fact a later edition. Thus, the reader of the Nestlaland does not need to get all the evidence of all the other manuscripts. It would be superfluous and wasting space. But why then is this, this edition mentioned at all? Well, it might be of interest if you are, for example, researching a specific manuscript or if you are interested in the development of the text. In cases like this, you will usually find a negative apparatus in the Nestle Island. Let us return to Romans 5 verse 1. I want to mention some more details of the apparatus. First, you see that a broken vertical line separates the variant reading from the reading of the text. Such lines also separate different variants within one unit. Solid vertical lines separate different apparatus units from each other. Second, the attestation of each reading always follows the same pattern. At the beginning, if extant, which is not the case here, any papyri evidence is shown. Then the unseals follow. The most prominent of them are represented by a single letter, like A or B, and others by a number which begins with a zero, like O22. Then the minuscules and lectionaries follow. They are always rendered by a number, without a beginning zero. If it is a lectionary manuscript, then the letter L stands before the number. After that, you occasionally see some abbreviations in italics, like in this case PM. They stand for Latin words and are explained, like all other abbreviations, in the introduction and, more easily to find, in the appendix Signa et Abbreviationis at the end of the edition and also in the little leaflet that is attached to the edition. P PM stands for per multi and it means many Greek manuscripts used where the majority is split. Next in line are the old translations of the Greek New Testament, the versions. In this example, you see LUT, which stands for the support of the Vulgate and a part of the old Latin tradition, as well as BO, which stands for the Bohiric. Both support the subjunctive here. In the second line, you read that VG, which stands for Vulgate, reads an indicative form. The addition of MSS in superscript means that just individual Vulgate manuscripts, but not the majority, has the respective reading. So this is no contradiction to the mentioning of LET, which includes the Vulgate in general, with the other reading. Finally, the evidence by Church Fathers is given. In this instance, there is only one mentioned, Marcion. By the way, this is a good example that the word church father is used in a pretty wide sense in the edition. The T in superscript means this is Marcion's reading according to Tertullian. I also want to point you to the little signs or characters in superscript which stand next to some Greek witnesses. For example, you find the Hebrew letter Aleph, which represents the Codex Sinaiticus, as both 
the variant reading and the reading of the text, but with different superscript characters. The star identifies the original reading of the manuscript. The numeral 1 stands for the first corrector of the manuscript, because this codex has been corrected several times. If it was only one layer of corrections, you would just find the letter C in superscript, standing for correction. Before getting lost in the apparatus, let's have a look at the references in the outer margin of the text. There are three kinds of references. First, the reader is pointed to parallel passages elsewhere in the New Testament. The prime example for this are the references to parallel pericopes in the Gospels. On the slide you can see the beginning of Mark 2 with a story about the healing of the paralyzed man. This passage can also be found in Matthew and Luke. This kind of references is shown in bold typeface. The second type are direct quotations from the Old Testament. In Matthew 5 verse 21, for example, Jesus quotes one of the Ten Commandments. These references are given in italic typeface, just like the respective words in the Greek text. By far the biggest amount of references belong to the third kind. They are printed in normal typeface and refer the reader to places within the Old and New Testaments worthwhile to consider when trying to make sense of the text. Within these references, those from the same biblical book appear first and are given without naming the book explicitly. Then references to other books follow. The abbreviations used here are shorter than the conventional ones which are used elsewhere in the edition. And generally, we have tried to print each reference as close as possible to the word or phrase in the Greek text to which they are linked. However, when there are many references, it might be difficult to connect them with the Greek text. Let me give you an example. The beginning of Romans. At first glance, you see that there are neither parallel pericopes nor direct quotations from the Old Testament in this passage. Nothing is printed in bold or italic typeface. However, there is a huge amount of other verses that shed light on this passage. Most important for a first overview are the vertical lines, which limit references related to one verse. In our example, there are, there are particularly many references for the first verse. The first vertical line indicates that the final reference for verse 1 is 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 2. Between this line and the next one, the references pertaining to verse 2 can be found. Matthew 1.1 1, 1, then is the first reference for verse 3 and 1 Timothy 3.16, the first one for verse 4. One may ask why there is also a line before the reference to 15.15 15 below, because here we don't have a problem of space. Well, with the help of this line, you immediately see that the reference is connected with verse 5 and not with verse 4. Then there are these raised dots. They separate references related to different parts of the same verse. Hence, the first four references in verse 1 all belong together. If you look them up, you will see that the writers of the respective letters call themselves a doulos, a slave of Christ or of God. The references to Psalms behind the dot, they are then related also to the word kletos in verse 1. And what about the exclamation marks? They indicate verses where further reference, references to the same thought or topic will be found. In Romans 15.15, 15, for example, to which the reader is referred in the margin of verse 5, additional references to the topic of God's grace, Charis, are listed. On the bottom of the slide you see Romans 15.15 15, with the references to other places in Romans as well as in other letters in the New Testament. Before we finally getting, get back to the textual apparatus, let us have a look at the inner margin. Two types of information are given here. First, throughout the New Testament you will find italic numbers. Here you see an example from Romans 1. There is a 1 at the beginning of the new paragraph at verse 18. 
The number indicates that many manuscripts have somehow marked this place as a first chapter division in Romans. You will know that the chapter divisions which we use today were developed only in the Middle Ages. But already early manuscripts had a system of dividing the text into sections. Here you see an image of the Codex Vaticanus with the transition from verse 17 to 18. The letter B at the margin indicates the division. The scholarly term for these divisions is Kephalaya. The next division in Codex Vaticanus follows before 2 verse 12. The second type of inner margin information can be found only in the Gospels. It's a system of links between parallel passages which stems from the church father Eusep. Once you are used to it, it is very simple. Let's go back to the healing of the paralyzed man in Mark 2 verse 1 and have a look at the inner margin there. The section and canon numbers always consist of two numbers, a Roman and an Arabic. Eusep organized the sections of the four Gospels into ten groups, which are called canons. The canons are printed at the end of the introduction of the Nestle Arland. The Roman numbers refer to these ten canons. In this case, you are referred to Canon 1. The headline in Quo Quatuor, in which 4, indicates that in this table comprises passages found in all four Gospels. Canons 2 to 4 list passages with parallels in three Gospels, Canon 5 to 9 list those found in only two Gospels, and Canon 10 list the sections which are peculiar to one Gospel. We now have to look for the Arabic number in the column of Mark. For this passage, it is the number 20. If you want to find the parallel passage in another Gospel, you have to look for the same Roman number, one, and the Arabic number which is displayed in the column for the respective gospel. For Matthew, for example, this is the number 70. If you now scroll through the pages of Matthew and look at the inner margin, you will easily find the parallel in 9 verse 1 at the bottom of the slide. Back to the apparatus. One feature which you will come across very often are manuscripts and brackets. The brackets are used when the wording of the respective witness differs slightly from the reading under which they are subsumed. Sometimes the wording of such sub-reading is rendered in the apparatus and sometimes it isn't. In Mark 5.37 we have both cases. The text reads, And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. There is a variant for the four words Udena met autu syn akalutesai. The two corresponding critical signs which are set around these words mean they are replaced by other words in some manuscripts. In the apparatus we see two alternative readings. One reads Udena auto syn akalutesai and the other Udena auto par. For both readings, there are slight variations in the manuscripts. For example, the uncials A and K, as well as the minuscules 33 and 1241, read akolutesai instead of syn akolutesai. This is explicitly shown in the apparatus. But what about D and W? How can we know what they read? In cases like this, we need to consult the appendix Varie Lectionis Minoris, other minor readings. There we find the precise wording of the readings which are not rendered in the apparatus. In this case, we are informed that D reads Ude ena paraculotesai auto and W reads auto udena paraculotesai. So both support the reading with paraculotesai, which is the main characteristic of this reading but with differences. Finally, I want to show how or whether we might know the reading of a specific manuscript if it is not listed in the apparatus. For this, we need to consult the introduction as well as one of the appendices. The introduction gives account of the choice of manuscripts to be rendered in the apparatus. 
It basically distinguishes between two kinds of manuscripts, consistently cited witnesses and occasionally cited witnesses. Here you can see the list for the Gospels. Now the appendix. In appendix 1, Codices, Greci and Latini, Greek and Latin manuscripts, you will find detailed information about all manuscripts used in the edition, the consistently and the occasionally cited manuscripts. Here you see the first page of the appendix. You are provided with the following information. Firstly, all manuscripts are dated. Secondly, the institutions where they are kept are listed. And thirdly, and this is essential for our question, the content of the manuscripts is described. And these two pieces of information from the introduction and the appendix will help us when we ask how we can know the reading of a manuscript when it is not mentioned in the apparatus. Where we have a positive apparatus, it is pretty easy. We can expect all consistently cited witnesses to be listed in the apparatus, provided they are extant and legible at a given place. If we go back to the apparatus unit in Romans 5 verse 1 and compare the witnesses presented here, top of the slide, with the list of consistently cited witnesses as found in the introduction, bottom of the slide, we immediately see that many are missing in the apparatus. The reason is simple, they aren't extant for Romans 5 verse 1. This is true for all papyri, but for example also for the Ancial O48. As we are instructed by Appendix 1, O48 has no text in Romans 5. And what does this mean for places with an adjective apparatus? Let us look again at Romans 3.27. Only very few manuscripts are mentioned here. You can't deduct from this brief list that all other consistently cited witnesses for Romans support the text reading. You would have to cross out from this list all manuscripts which have, according to Appendix 1, no text in Romans 3.27. From the remaining ones, you may assume that they support the text reading. However, at this point we are facing the limitations of a hand edition because sometimes manuscripts have very small lacunae so that just a few words or letters are not legible. This is not listed in the appendix. So you should be cautious with conclusions e silencio. If you really need to be on the safe side, you have to look into the manuscripts, manuscripts which has fortunately become much easier in recent years due to the availability of images and transcripts on the internet. I especially refer you to the New Testament Virtual Manuscript Room by the Institute for New Testament Textual Research in Münster. This can be used as a supplement to the Nestle Arland, just as the Nestle Arland can be seen as a gateway to the manuscripts. The future may lie in a combination of both, of the presentation of the, of the full first-hand evidence in the internet, internet and the wise choice and user-friendly editing of the most relevant information in a hand edition like the Nestle Island.